the 1919 Sex Disqualification Act began to open up opportunities for women in the professions, such as law and civil service, and working in the cinema was no exception. Women's twilight shifts in the new industries in the 1930s, such as manufacturing and engineering, provided employment opportunities, which not only generated money for leisure activities like cinema going, but also where similar professional women could also be found. The demographic changes that occurred within Britain's workforce during the Second World War via compulsory conscription created a staffing problem for the cinema industry on the ground level and presented new challenges for the government regarding gender issues. This consequently threatened cinema's ability to remain operational because how could they provide this much needed leisure and propaganda facility without its workforce? So the cultural changes and continued continuities that wartime created began polarizing debates about wartime employment for women, with some like Arthur Marwick in the 60s arguing that involvement enhanced their status, while more recent scholarship by Penny Summerfield and Jerry Holloway suggested gender divisions continued after the war. Cinemas were hierarchical, respectable, but hierarchical places for employment, offering roles to both men and women, with gender an important fact regarding what particular spaces you could access. So cinemas respectable but hierarchical places of employment, offering roles to both men and women, with gender an important factor regarding what particular spaces you could access. As seen here, Britain's wartime cinemas were largely managed by men, those in the suits. Some councils who provided the cinema with its license in order to be operational actually specified male managers because they believed that women would not inspire an audience with any confidence during air raids or emergencies. There are female uniformed usherettes and male projectionists, those in the white coat similar to a lab worker, thus signifying a technical expertise. And at the back of the cinemas, there were had commissionaires in those days to welcome customers who was usually an old soldier too old for war duty. The 1909 Cinematographic Act introduced safety measures for film exhibition, and Usherette's first emerged due to, due to these safety regulations, especially when film was nitrate based and liable to burst into flames. They became a uniform presence and their recognisability helped as they assisted in the smooth operation of cinema going, not only for the safety of patrons, but in collecting tickets, selling ice creams, cleaning the auditorium and showing people to their seats with their iconic usherettes torch, which was also used to keep an eye out for troublemakers. Usherettes were respectable jobs for women, which fitted around family commitments with various shift arrangements, as Jean here explains. I became an usheress in the Winter Gardens because um, I had a young baby and money was short and the only one who could mind the baby was my husband when he came home from work. It, so um, it was part time. It was either in the evenings or the Saturday matinee. So the usherette has become part of the Picture Palace's dream world with their stylish uniforms and glamour, as we can see here. Their uniforms mirrored that of a domestic servant, signifying their work was feminised and domesticated. And this formality echoed the corporate organisation of some cinema chains, like the Odeon. Usherettes therefore contributed to the escapist world of cinema and became part of cinema's collective identity, as well as providing a conduit between the real dull world outside and the fantasy world of film. Usherettes therefore had a dual role for safety for safety and to inject a bit of Hollywood glamour to patrons to counteract the drabness of wartime. They were therefore often presented to the public in an intentionally sexualised manner. Smart, clean uniforms and an orderly staff was therefore crucial. Cinema management regularly inspected them, thus they were controlled and policed by the industry, with an expectation of how they should behave. With Olive Durant from the region Portsmouth recalling, we had to line up in front of him and we had to be very smart. You had to have stockings on with steam scenes that went right up at the back. Similarly, Florence Wall also agreed that being an usherette was associated with glamour, and it was the nearest thing she could get to being a film star. Concurring with Vera Ayres, you, you felt very nice in a smart uniform and high heels. Yet, with wartime rationing from June 41, staff had to use their own ration coopers to purchase these work clothes, with the hopes of getting an essential user allowance rebuffed. 
Consequently, if one charrette left, a similar shaped person would be employed to fill their uniforms. They were therefore often presented to the public in an intentionally sexualized manner, with many of charrettes often tailoring their uniforms to make them feel a bit more appealing. Of course, when the American GIs came over in 43, they seemed to have a lot to answer for, looking at uh, Caesar's talk. Many of the charrettes recall having to fend off their amorous attentions with their torch, with Margaret Hunt acknowledging that we had to stand our ground with some of them, while sisters Irish and Violet Jordan, usherettes at the Regal Evesham, were not too impressed with their brash but well-meaning attitude. However, not all usherette life was glamorous. They worked on sociable hours and were expected to maintain their demeanour. Sometimes they had to spray the auditorium with disinfectant and insecticides like flit to eliminate the odours from having several people in one room for a few hours and to kill off any unwanted creatures like fleas that ventured into these highly populated places, as one customer from the Black Country recalls. I remember going to see the Johnson film and we were in the queue. And I've watched the fleas jump off one another. <laughs> and they used to come and spray, yeah. <laughs> That's how sure it is. So I'm going to now talk about projectionists in cinemas. And in those days, until this century's digital projection, film was shot on a flexible film stock. Reels of films were delivered in cases for preparation by the, the projectionists for that week's film programme. And it's hard to imagine with just one film being shown today that cinemas then offered a full afternoon or an evening's entertainment with continuous performances of adverts, newsreel, cartoons, the second feature of a lesser quality, the B film, and eventually the main feature film. And you could pop in at any time and even spend all day there. Complete programmes usually occur between Monday to Wednesday with a midweek change Thursday to Saturday with few cinemas opening on Sundays and larger cinemas changed like the Odeon had films for at least a week at the time. So I'll just give a quick resume of what a projectionist did and also what I did when I first started working as one 35 years ago. Two large cinema projectors were situated in an operating booth, the box, high up in the back of the auditorium to project the film onto a large screen in front of the auditorium. Individual reels of film about 15, 20 minutes long were shown in order between these two projectors by at least two operators. 20 minute reels being the limitation of the light source, which was a burning carbon arc. And just remember, these were nitrate based films that could burn it, you know, go up in flames. The film would be laced up in each projector through a series of gates and rollers under tension. While the first reel in the projector was working, the second projector was ready with the next reel. And when the first reel was shown, it was unlaced and rewound for the next showing. Switching between projectors therefore had to appear seamless to the audience, with cue dots etched into the film to indicate changeovers. Most features were about five to six reels long and occasionally shorter reels of adverts, trailers for forthcoming films and news reels were spliced together for the run and then unspliced or broken down to return to the next cinema. The projection of film onto screens was therefore, due to its technicalities, perceived to be a male-dominated occupation. And this has continued to be stereotyped in films today. You may remember Peter Sellers in The Smallest Show on Earth and Brad Pitt in Fight Club. And even the projectionist in Gremlins was a man. So any allowances for the possibility that there may be female projectors, project projectionists, was not even considered as indicated in the Cinema Trade Handbook of Cinematography, they said, the operating box should allow sufficient elbow room for the operator and his assistant to move about freely between the projector or projectors and winding and film storage benches. Yet, following conscription, 85% of the highly skilled male operators were lost, whereas there was always young girls wanting to be usherettes. The loss was worse in industrial areas because there was competition from better paid employment in fa for factories for war work. The governing body for film exhibition, exhibition, the CEA, the Cinematograph Exhibition Association, tried to make projectionists a reserved occupation as they were in their words, key men in the industry, but this was only partially successful. Yet the forces in the Second World War deemed women as capable of showing film. They often use females to training films on smaller cine films, as, as seen here, and to use for forces entertainment in ENSA concerts. 
but there are anxieties about using them in a commercial role. However, realising the importance of the cinema for morale, the CEA decided that due to the shortage of trained cinema operators, the men, the other half of Britain's eligible working population, the females, could be utilised as an emergency measure to meet the contingencies of war. So female projectionists was not really a new idea, especially in the early days when cinema was often family run businesses with husband and wife sharing their roles. However, there were tensions within the film industry right from the First World War, with the belief that women may, may not only take over their jobs, but they wouldn't be very good at it or be very professional. And like the lady at the bottom of the film, um, of the slide would state they'd be assumed that they'd only sit and eat chocolates and read books while they're changing the reels. So the CA began to organise schemes to train women as female operators who were called projectionettes or operettes. The role of projectionist being feminised similar to the munition workers in the First World War being called munitionettes. Many women seized these opportunities despite the unequal pay, the limited prospects, and, and patronisation as seen here by the press to meet wartime needs. An adverse happened in the local papers. Training schemes for women operators began with the Granada Group, like the Odeon and the ABC, and about eventually about 800 were trained initially. Of course, the women were mostly below the age of female conscription, which is now compulsory since 41, or the mothers of young children and came from the diverse range of occupations. They were taught the basics of electricity at key centres like London, Birmingham and Bristol, but training was largely on the job. However, many women on the job were dismissed by the resident male operators regarding their dress, their strength and their technical competency. They said women's clothes were likely to be flimsy and may get caught in the machines. And some were dismissed if they believed working in an operating box, remember it's high up in the theatre, was a way of getting closer to the stars. If they complained about the strenuous film work involved in carrying film reels up several flights of stairs to the box, which was often outside, they weren't invited to train. They were also dismissed by their lack of technical expertise, which is hardly surprising as female education rarely had any of this tuition. Nevertheless, some women came through these setbacks, although there were restrictions to employing women once they were trained. They weren't employed if a trained male was available, they were paid less than the men, and men returning from the, from the military, such as disabled veterans, would be installed instead. Projectionists then had a re recognised career path, consisting of a chief operator, a first and a second and a third operator, and a young rewind boy, overseeing the film from the male-dominated box. Yet, training and consequently job prospects was also dependent upon where you lived. For example, in England and Wales, women could only qualify as a third assistant, answerable to the second, the first and the chief. While in Scotland, they had a two-tier system with a first and a second, which gave women operators much more opportunities, responsibility and subsequently higher pay. However, the men did acknowledge that women's more sensitive touch and greater patience made them more competent at rewinding and maintaining film reels, as this was considered to be not so technically demanding. They eventually conceded that women were efficient at lacing up the projector and splicing the reels together, as this was thought of to be similar to a craft-based skill like sewing, thus conforming to women's stereotypes. Their mastery of such techniques was put down to their nimble fingers as it's pretty fiddly job lacing a projector and believed it was a natural, innate and feminine skill. And if you looked at old films, many women went on to become film editors like Alma Revel and Alfred Hitchcock's wife. Flo Griswood was one of the first female projectionist at the cinema West Ham, thus challenging the established ideology of female gender boundaries. And eventually female operators became accepted during the war as they donned their steel helmets during bombing raids and gamely carried on. However, younger male operators like Roland at the Dudley Odeon often objected to women projectionists as like most men, he believed they were being trained to deprive them of their job. 
And as he was only a young, boisterous 16 year old, he often had a bit of fun with the audience, such as when he showed the film, one of our aircraft is missing, he turned on the spotlight and waved it about the auditorium to simulate an air raid and provide a bit of atmosphere. But however, he recalls having to curtail these extracurricular activities when a women operator came to be in charge. We had one girl there and her uh, name was Mary Price. And uh, she was senior, of course, to us because she was 16. And she was about in her 30s or something like that, you know. But she trained, she was trained and she did well and all the rest of it because she was more responsible than what we were. So Florence Barton at the Scala Coventry trained at Birmingham. She believed that her own competencies, regardless of gender, were a key component of her success, and she eventually became chief. And as her oral testimonies here indicate, she appeared not to be trifled with. They didn't have women till after the November Blitz, and then they started calling the men up. They asked some of us women whether we would like to try it and see if we liked it. And much to their surprise or disgust, they never did tell me which. I turned out to be very good at it. You... Her testimony indicates her determination, which eventually paid off as she managed to get chief's wages, but only after doing the role for five years. Nevertheless, Florence faced further difficulties with the men who were reluctant to expect that, accept her superiority, as they sabotaged her projector after she'd been away a few days. It appeared that you could only succeed in a fight for women's rights to be employed where you wanted if you had the stubbornness, resilience and confidence to complain like Florence. Such diligence paved the way for Joan Pearson, who progressed from being an usherette to an operator. Her husband, Bill, was a chief operator at the ABC at Birmingham and after helping him, she became one herself. Yet while this role offered new opportunities to access a masculine space in wartime, it didn't lead to any great transformation regarding this vital service at the end of the war, as it was considered for the duration of the war only, despite female projectionists being integral to the public cinema going experiences. They were therefore expected to return to other roles after the war, with even the editor of the Complete Projectionist Manual com commenting that, Although there is no specific ban, women newcomers are not likely to be welcomed in the projection room. There was therefore a degree of unfinished business in providing equal opportunities for female projectionists after the war, as there was now a recruitment drive for male operators. So if we've got wanting a youth and wanting a boy. Given the right opportunities, Second World War pioneering projectionists like Florence Barting at Coventry and Joan at Pearson remained in the projection box to create their own professional niche. Yet women projectionists like me are still viewed, viewed as a novelty today, although I like to think I've made some inroads into breaking the perceived glass ceiling for women's roles in a male-dominated business. Thank you.